Happy Sabbath. Thank you for being here. We come to the end of the week, not the end of the series, but the end of the week. And we're going to talk about a solemn subject this evening. It doesn't get much more serious than this. So let's bow our heads and we will begin. Father in heaven, Lord, we're grateful for you sending Jesus to this earth, Lord, to rescue us. And Lord, we know that the days that we live in are evil, that things are trembling all around. And Lord, we're going to open the book, your word tonight, and study on this subject. I pray that you will convict every heart here and every heart that is listening online. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so this is entitled The Solemn and Biblical Finality of the Close of Probation. And this is a term that we use in the Adventist church, the close of probation. And uh, it, it is used to express the idea that at some point in time, God ceases to plead with the sinner. That all of the entreaties are made. That all of the tellings of the gospel and the story of salvation and the invitation for mercy, the beautiful news that Jesus has bought you, that he has bought you back, that all at some point in time that this story has been told and that the end comes. Because there has to be an end. And some people think, well, this doctrine, this close of probation idea, this idea that God's Spirit will be withdrawn from this earth and that humanity is left, wicked humanity is left to their own devices, that's not, how could that be biblical? But like all of the doctrines, like all of the doctrines that we believe, this doctrine, this idea has ample evidence in the scriptures. And so I would like to open up this subject tonight with the question, is the close of probationary time biblical? The alternative is, is that this is just going to continue indefinitely. Is the world going to continue indefinitely? Is there going to be a thousand years of peace? You see the governments of the earth making war against each other. You see humanity embracing doctrines like evolutionism, which has become near universal on the whole planet, which denies the existence of the Creator. It denies the existence of the atonement, the purchasing back of Christ's children. This idea that we came from lobsters or monkeys, you know, this is what humanity has embraced. Where is Jesus in that picture? Jesus does not need to die for the lobsters or their descendants. Okay, so you have this doctrine which has embraced, that is one doctrine, one false doctrine that is embraced. It's completely unbiblical, and yet it is orthodoxy in our world today. Is it not? How many of you go to public school? Okay, public school, I've been to public school, some of you go to public school. All you hear about is evolution, just about. Okay, you descended from a monkey. And um, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Adam was created in God's image, that he was the son of God. That is the words that the Bible uses. That there's nobody in Adam's, Adam's lineage except for God. There's no lobsters, there's no monkeys, it's just God made Adam, and that's where it starts. And that means you have a heavenly father, and that means you have a redeemer who bought you back. Amen. So the question is here, is God just going to let this go on and on and on? The gospel is going around the world. The Bibles are going around the world. Does it just go on indefinitely, or is there an end? Jesus says he's coming back. Is that true? What happens when he comes back? When Jesus comes back, what happens? It's over. Or as a pastor uh, down in the south says, I hear him say it all the time, it's over, y'all. That's what he says. Because he's looking at the world around, and he's looking at the signs of the Bible regarding the end of days. And people don't like to talk about end of days, even in, in this church. Some people don't want to talk about end of days. They say, well, it's, that's not, it's not end of days. We don't, you know, it could be 500 years from now. There's a prominent evangelist, we won't leave, we'll leave his name out. But, you know, he says it could be another 500 years in private conversation. It could, be another, it could be 500 years. I don't think it's now. 
Do we believe? Do we believe in the close of probationary time? And what does that mean? It means there's a line. And past that line, either you're in or you're out. Let's look at story number one. Now, what is that in the water there? How many of you are familiar with the story of the flood? Okay. You know, the story of the flood, the Bible tells us exactly what happened. I had a friend of mine out at a creek recently, within the last 10 days or so. I got covered in poison ivy. I'm still, like, itching from it. And uh, I took him and his uh, sons into this creek. And uh, I said to him, you're going to see creationism. You're going to see creationism in the flood today. And we started digging in this spot. And there was this much gravel. And in the gravel were all the marine animals that were destroyed. All the sharks and things like that. And their bones and their teeth are all in this layer like this. And you know what else we dug out of there? A horse tooth. Two of them. With the sharks. Why are the horses with the sharks? It's simple. Because this, this earth was destroyed by water and it got all jumbled together. And the people live in the cities and they think to themselves, well, that can't be, right? We've never seen anything like that. If you go and you explore the earth, you get out of the city, you go walk around, you go walking in a creek bed, you'll find all sorts of stuff. You go to the right spots in this country, you'll find all sorts of things. I was recently at a creek and there were trees, pieces of trees five or six feet long, and they were hard as a rock. They had turned to stone. And they were, their pieces were laying all over the place. And my nephews were gathering them up and carrying them. My nephew had a piece of wood like this. He's nine years old, and he carried it like a quarter of a mile back to the car. It weighs like 40 pounds. He's struggling with it like an ant with a piece of cucumber. I mean, he was, you know, he was overjoyed to see it. But why do you think that stuff exists? It's because the old world was destroyed. That's why. This stuff is left as an evidence that the flood is a real event. And in the water there in that picture is people. There's people inside the boat. There's people on the outside of the boat. Genesis 6, 11, and 13 says that the earth was full of violence. So that tells you that God doesn't like violence. Because one of the primary reasons that he destroys the earth the first time is because the earth was full of violence. Humanity killing humanity. People fighting. People making war. And in our world today, we watch violence for recreation. People love violence. If it doesn't have violence in a movie or a TV show, they won't watch it. People get together and they go to these big stadiums and they watch these two people pound each other until their faces look like tomato soup. And they love that. They scream and they yell. They say, rah, rah, rah. And then they go to church. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? The earth was full of violence. The earth was corrupt. Is our earth corrupt? Do we got people making deals on the side? We got politicians greasing the wheels of the pharmaceutical industry, taking money and giving bribes. Do we have courts that are corrupt? The thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually. So these are the things that led to the destruction of the earth the first time. You look around. Does it look like that? It looks just like that. This world is ripe for the judgments of God. And God told Noah, build an ark. Build an ark. Because this is it. This is it. And so God makes a line. The Lord said unto Noah, this is Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Come thou and all your house into the ark, for you have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 4. For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So notice how specific God is. Does he have a timeline? Right? 
He says, build an ark. You're going to preach. Noah preached for 120 years. Then God says to him, get in the ark. He says, once you get in the ark, there's going to be seven days. And then it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Very specific. And the Bible is actually very specific about when this happens as well. We'll come to that. Every living substance that I've made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord had commanded him. This is a real event. You know, we think to ourselves, this is just a story. You start walking around and you're like, oh, hmm, this actually happened. There's a tree. There's a dinosaur. There's a woolly mammoth. There's a horse. There's a shark. Oh, yeah, they were all covered up the same time. How did that happen? Even the evolutionists say, yeah, we can't explain it. I mean, there was an asteroid or something, and it covered up. It, it hit the ocean, and the water went everywhere. We can see that there was some sort of a flood. Uh, but it's not this flood, but it, you know, we can see that it was some sort of flood. You know, they sort of don't like to talk about that aspect of things. Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old. That's interesting. 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Notice how specific. Noah went in, his sons, his wife, his sons' wives with him into the ark, and because of the waters of the flood... And then, of course, you have the beasts. They all come in, two by two, seven by seven. And it came to pass after seven days. So just like God said, it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. So it's very specific. Isn't that interesting? The Bible tells you exactly when it started to rain. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Does God know what he's talking about? He tells Noah this is what's going to happen and then the exact thing that he says is going to happen. We should sort of tuck that away in our mind's eye, I think. Because if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You could take that to the bank. That is where you should be writing your policies and your procedures, your manuals, your planning and things like that. Because if God says it, it's going to happen. Absolutely certain the word never lies. And they all went in, male and female. Notice that there's only two genders. As God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So the Lord shut Noah in with the animals. You see that? It's very interesting. God shut the door. All right, so you look at the elements in this story. You're all familiar with this story. Okay? But what I want to point out here tonight, and I'm sorry that this is so small, but in this story, you have the following elements. Investigation. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for you have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So is God watching Noah? He's been investigating Noah. So you have an investigative judgment of Noah. And God says to him, I have found you after my investigation. I have seen that you are righteous. Come into the ark with your family. And then you have ministry. Because Noah was a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2 verse 5 says. So Noah preaches 120 years. He preaches 120 years and he is warning people, this event is going to take place. This is not fiction, folks. He's telling them. This is a real event. And the birds are twittering outside and people are playing golf. And Noah's like, it's going to be the end right away. And they're like, you're crazy. And he ministers to those people who thought he was crazy for 120 years. Then you have a separation. Come into the ark. How is that a separation? If no one is family or inside the ark, who, is, who are they being separated from? All the people who aren't in the ark. Is that so? So you have Noah in the ark and you have people on the outside of the ark. So there is a separation in the story. Okay? Notice the elements investigation, you have ministry, you have separation, then you have the door shutting. 
Okay? The shutting of the door closes off the people who have made a decision for God and who are living in faith according to the promises that he has made and the people who have not. Okay, and probably in this church, even right now, online, we have people right now, they have not made a decision for God. Praise the Lord, the door of mercy is open. Today the door of mercy is open. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus loves you. But he has to bring things to an end on this earth. That's just the reality of the story. Then you have the passage of a short time, seven days, Genesis 7.10, and then you have destruction, verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. All that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. Skipping down there, And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So again, very specific. This is a real event. This is a historical event. And it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again, and the reason why this is recorded is so that we are ready. 2 Peter 2, 1-5 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So what are these false teachers saying? They're denying the existence of God. Not just are they denying the existence of God, but they're denying that God bought them. What did we talk about for the first three nights of these meetings? That Jesus has bought humanity. He bought humanity back. He loves humanity. But Jesus is not going to force the will of people. He says, I want to fix you. I want to clean you. I want to make you righteous. I want to put in you a new heart. But he's not going to force anybody. Nobody is forced to get on the ark. Nobody is forced to get a new heart. And so the people who are teaching... The people who are teaching in the public schools, the people who are teaching in institutions of higher learning, sometimes in religious institutions of higher learning, sometimes in our religious institutions of higher learning, are saying that Jesus didn't buy us and there's no destruction coming. This is not the end. We don't believe in all this stuff on the Bible. This is the narrative that is constantly being promoted to young people. And to those in school. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell or down to this earth and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the word of the ungodly. So he's saying, Peter's saying, if God did this to the old world, if he's serious about this, then he's serious about our day too. And that's the reality of it. Second Peter 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So what happens at the end of the world? You're going to have people saying, Ah, we've been hearing about the end of the world forever. Tell me another one, Noah. That's what's going to happen. And all around this world, this is taking place. This is what people are saying. This is what people are saying. We are living in the last days. We are living in the last days. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. For this they willingly are ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of God, ungodly men. So the waters before that were used to destroy the old world are compared to the fires that are kept in reserve to destroy this world. That is what the Bible says. Now, for some reason in Christianity today, you don't hear much about this. 
You hear fictions about, uh, regarding what is about to happen. They don't talk about, well, the fire is going to destroy this earth. Almost nobody in Christianity says that. Is that like plain up here in, in black and white? What do you think? If this is clear, raise your hand. Let's see by a show of hands. Okay, so the Bible says that the waters from before are compared to the fires in our day. You never hear about that these days. They say, oh, we're all going to get together. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. You know, hell is in some place down the, in some place we can't see and the devil's in charge of hell and, you know, that's where you go where you die. But they don't talk about what's coming on this earth. It's mass media. That is, the, that is the orthodoxy, right? There is an orthodox narrative. When I say there's an orthodox narrative, that's the mainstream news. The mainstream news in Christianity is not this. Somehow we've lost this. All right, Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was it like in Noah's day? Eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building houses, right? They, they got their own lives, playing golf, right? Doing all the things that they like to do. They're completely oblivious to the fact that the end is coming. If you, if you give this presentation in the public school, they'd run you out of the school. They'd run you out of the school. And they'd tell you this is fiction. But this is not fiction. This is reality. The same people who would run you out of the school would tell you that they're a Christian, they would tell you, well, Jesus and evolution, that's, that's the same thing. It's compatible. And no, it's not. The same people who say that this is a Christian nation, how many times do you hear that? What percentage of this country that says it's a Christian nation believes in creation and the fall? Maybe 20% of Christians today believe in creation and the fall. The rest of them believe in lobsterism. Okay, that you come from the crustaceans. So the same people who say that this is a Christian nation, they have jettisoned the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> but Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now here is, here is the main point of the story of Noah that I want to draw your attention to. The close of probation for the old world was not the flood. The close of probation was the closing of the door of the ark. Okay, do you see the difference there? So, Noah's inside, there's people outside, the door is shut. Noah continues inside, they continue outside for a period of time. They're making fun of Noah because he's inside Noah's thinking, did I make a mistake here? You know, I have to trust God's word. He said seven days is going to pass, then it's going to start to rain. Those were the longest days of Noah's life. Because he invested 120 years into building this ark. Him and his family. And endured 120 years of mockery and scorn and ridicule. And Noah is thinking to himself, I have invested everything in this. And his faith was tried. His faith was tested in that moment. And on the eighth day, it started to rain. And by the time it started to rain, it was too late. This is the point that we need to fix in our mind's eye. By the time it starts to rain, it's too late. It's over. When the rain starts to fall, it is too late to change teams. All the teams are decided. You're either in or you're out, and the door was shut beforehand. And so it is a very dangerous thing today. We have a tendency to have a foot in both camps, don't we? We have a foot, a foot in both camps. And that is potentially fatal. It can be fatal. So is this real? Is this real? Is the close of probation real? It's real. So this is story number one, the Ark of Noah. Spirit of Prophecy says this. I just want to direct your attention to this quote. As the time of their probation was closing, 
The antediluvians, that means the people who lived before the flood. Anti being before diluvians, that's the flood of water. The people who lived before the flood gave themselves up to exciting amusements and festivities. Those who possessed influence and power were bent on keeping the minds of the people engrossed with mirth and pleasure, lest any should be impressed by the last solemn warning. So the time is ticking. You can imagine the great egg timer that God has set up. Big egg timer, 120 years, and the sand is dripping through, okay? And as there's very little sand left, do you know what they're doing? They're at the movies. They're on Netflix. They're binge-watching their favorite shows. They're playing video games. Right? They're engaged in speculative practices and making money and running, you know, this, this, their eyes are over here. Their eyes are not on the event that is about to happen. And God gives them this jarring sign as a last wake-up call. Because the animals come two by two, seven by seven, from, from all out there in the forests, the whole planet wide. The angels bring the animals into the ark. And all the people who are, you know, all the people who are making fun of Noah, they see the animals coming. Here's the elephants walking down the street on the way to Noah's ark. And they're like, say what? You know, here's the lions and the tigers and the peacocks and the ostriches and the buffaloes and, you know, the giraffes. And they're all coming down the street and they're getting in the ark. The animals are smarter than the people. Do we not see the same repeated in our day? The people who have influence. Those who possess influence and power are trying to keep people's minds distracted while probation closes. That's Satan's work, is to keep people's minds distracted. Taylor Swift has a concert. You know? This so-and-so is doing this presentation. This guy's running for political office. Right? There's a thousand things to keep our attention. It's politics and entertainment and food and travel and everything. You can have everything you want on this device. Yes? Yeah. Everything. Like there's nothing, that, there's nothing on this device that you can't have. Any wickedness you want is just a press of a button away. Is that so? Do we not see the same thing repeated in our day? While God's servants are giving the message that the end of all things is at hand, the world is absorbed in amusements and pleasure-seeking. Is that the message that we're telling people? The gospel and the last warning. The end of all things is at hand. I, I tremble for our church because I don't, I don't hear this message much these days. The people who are supposed to be watching on the walls, they're asleep. There's crickets and the sound of snoring. You don't hear much about the end of all things is at hand. If somebody says that even in our church, they're like, that guy's a fanatic. The world is absorbed in amusements and pleasure seeking. There is a constant round of excitement that causes indifference to God and prevents the people from being impressed by the truths which alone can save them from the coming of destruction. How are we saved from the coming of destruction? We are told to get in the ark. Salvation is abundant. Salvation is abundant. Jesus bought you back. He loves you. He has joined himself to humanity. He has poured out all of heaven to redeem you. And he has redeemed you. Jesus has redeemed you. He has bought you back. He has bought you back. But yet, even the people who are bought back, they're like, we, have, we still have time. We still have time to go over here and, and do our own thing. It's not today. You know, it's not tomorrow. Do you think that's dangerous? You're playing Russian roulette if that's what you're doing with your salvation. You know what Russian roulette is, right? That's you spin the chamber of that gun and you pull the trigger and you hope there's no bullet in the chamber. <clears throat> Many are eagerly participating in worldly, demoralizing amusements which God's word forbids. 
You just think to yourself, you don't have to say it out loud, worldly demoralizing amusements. Is that, does, that, does that account for what we are entertained by today? Worldly and demoralizing. I used to work at a video store back in the day when there was such a thing. Now there's no such thing as video stores. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with life, so I went to work at the video store. Short period of time, I watched a lot of movies during that period of time. I'd bring home a stack of movies like this. I don't even think there was a limit on how many movies I could bring home. Back then, you have to have a stack of movies like this to watch like nine movies. Now movies are on your phone. All you need is your phone, right? Back in the day, you had a VCR. You, you, guys don't, you kids don't even know what that is, <laughs> okay? You slide the tape in, and for two hours, you watch some mind-numbing garbage. My mother would look at my stack of movies, and she said, these are all rated R. Are you really going to watch that? Yeah. You know? And I would, I would be blissed out in the basement watching R-rated movies. I don't even have a TV now. I don't have a TV. I don't have time for TV. And neither do you. You don't have time for TV. The average American is watching something like three to five hours of TV a day. That's like hours of their, that's, out, that's years of their life. They're spending, some people are spending up to 13 hours a day playing video games. On average, this is their life. They're hooked in, they're plugged in. Okay, and while, while they are doing that, the sand from the hourglass is, tip, is, is, is draining away. This is the precious probation. Why is probation ours? Why do we have this day, this moment, to where we can breathe? You can breathe today. Why? Because Jesus bought you this time. Amen. Jesus didn't buy you this time so that you could fritter it away. And me either. You know, the best thing that some people could do is get rid of this. Get a flip phone. Amen. You know? Find something else to do with your time that's constructive and is not stealing your salvation. You know, because by beholding you become changed. What you watch, it affects you. Did you know that Anton Sander LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, says that in every single family's house, there is an altar to the devil. Every house. It's called the television. And he said that back in the 60s. You know, I mean, we are living in perilous times. The quote finishes, The sins that destroyed the antediluvians and the cities of the plain exist today, not merely in heathen lands, not among popular professors of Christianity, but with some who profess to, for, uh, to be looking for the coming of the Son of Man. If God should present these sins before you as they appear in his sight, you would be filled with shame and terror. So how does God see these things? You know, we don't think about that. We have become very acclimatized to wickedness. Because we grow up in wickedness, we grow up in slavery, this is the culture, it's in your school, it's in your house, it's in your, it's in your society. That is where what people spend their time on is wickedness. And we are, we are desensitized to it. But if you could see these things as, God, as they appear to God, you would be filled with shame and terror. That's pretty solemn stuff. You know, I watched a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have watched. And I, I wish I hadn't watched any of it because sometimes it comes up in my mind and, you know, I prefer that it would not do that. But, you know, what you put into your head, it's sort of permanent. All right, story number two, close of probation. Where is the close of probation in this story? Okay. Story number two. How many of you are familiar with the close, with, uh, sorry, with the story of Lot? Okay, and his escape with his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, not everybody in his family made it out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a picture in the background. That's the city being destroyed. That's going to happen again, we are told. Jesus says, get out. Get out. Do not stay there. It's interesting that in the story of Lot, you have the same, you have the same elements as in the story of Noah. All right, are you ready? investigation. Okay, so Abraham is arguing with God. Or he's pleading with God, rather. He's telling God, will you destroy it for 50's sake? 
Because God has come down and he says to Abraham, I'm watching Sodom and Gomorrah. That city is full of perversion. It's full of immorality. It's full of cross-dressing and confusion and sexual corruption and violence. And God says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy that city. And Abraham's nephew lives in that city, and he comes to God and he says, God, can we talk about this? I know what you said, you mean it. You're going to kill this, and you know, you're going to destroy the city. I, you know, far be it from me. I don't want to interfere. But if there could be 50, 50 righteous people in that city, God. 50, God. You won't destroy it if there's 50. Tell me, Lord, please, that you will not destroy it if there's 50. And God says, all right, I won't destroy it for the sake of 50. And Abraham says, 45. What about 45? He's negotiating with God for the salvation of the people in the city. God says, okay, 45. What about 40, God? Okay, all right. I hear what you're saying, Abraham. I, what you're doing right now You're making intercession. Incidentally, Abraham sees God in the door of his tent. So God is coming. Abraham's sitting in the door of his tent. So Abraham is in a tent. He's in a sanctuary. Making intercession for the people in the city. Okay, does that remind you of anything? Right? Where is our high priest? He is in the sanctuary. What is he doing? He's making intercession. So Abraham is a type of Christ in this story. Abraham is interceding with God. Abraham is saying, don't destroy the city for the sake of 40. And God says, okay, I won't. And Abraham says, what about 30? And God says, okay, 30. What about 20? Okay, 20. What about 10, God? 10. Okay, I will not destroy it for 10. I don't know what would have happened if if Abraham had said one or two, but he stops at 10. He stops at 10. And he knows how wicked Sodom is. Because Abraham every once in a while has occasion to go down to the Whole Foods in Sodom, maybe, to get his tofu or whatever it is, okay? He's got to go down into Sodom and he's got to mix it up with the people every once in a while. Sometimes he goes to see Lot. Abraham knows how wicked Sodom is. He doesn't live there, but he knows how wicked it is. And so you have an investigation. Why are the angels sent down into Sodom? They're investigating. There is an investigative judgment Who is the investigative judgment of? It's of those who profess to be righteous. The investigative judgment is not for the wicked. The investigative judgment is for those who profess to be righteous. Those who profess to be God's people. That is who is being investigated. You'll notice that they don't present themselves to Harry and Steve. You know, they present themselves to Lot. And Lot offers them hospitality and they come into the house. And when, you know, Lot takes them, you know, by a back way probably to, through the alleyways. He doesn't want the men of Sodom to see these strangers. It's nighttime. These guys are like, it's Mardi Gras every single day in Sodom. You've heard of Mar- Mardi Gras, right? Right? And all the, all the carousing in the streets and stuff like that. That's what it's like in Sodom every single day. And that's what it's like in our cities today. In a lot of cities. It's not very different at all. And they come to the door and they bang on the door and they say, those men who came down here, we want to have sex with them. So bring them out. And Lot goes out of the door into the city and he ministers to them. He says, brothers, do not so wickedly. So he ministers to the people of Sodom. He says, don't do this. This is wicked. And what is their response? They say to him, who are you to judge us? Notice the investigative judgment involves ministry. It involves your ministry to the people around you. It involves your ministry to the people of this community to tell them that time is short. Don't do so wickedly. He preaches this sermon to them as a last warning. You know, this is the last warning that these people ever receive. It's the last warning they ever get from the God of heaven through his servant, Lot. And they say... 
you thought we were going to rape your friends? We're going to rape you. And we're going to tear you into pieces. And the angels grab him and pull him back into the house. It reminds me of a story. I was, I don't know, maybe 17. And I went to a camp meeting. And you know, some kids at camp meeting, they're not involved in very good things. You know, you know that, right? You know, you got, you know, kids who are involved in nice things, but you got kids who are involved in not good things. I ended up at a bush party. I ended up at a bush party. And there was a lot of drinking going on. I didn't drink. I never really got into that. And the guy who had organized the party, he's standing by the stereo with the big speakers and the fire is eight feet tall. And like, it's just this really kind of weird environment. People are, you know, they're doing drugs and they're drinking and, you know, a lot of, you know, kids who are waiting for the second coming who are there. <clears throat> and the guy says, anybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ, stand up. And so I started to stand up and my cousin grabs my shoulder and pulls me back down. And he says, you are not, are you insane? He's like, we're out of here, we're leaving. You know, and that's what happened to Lot. Lot went out there to do God's bidding. He went out there to give the last message of warning to this city. They had to be warned as part of the investigative judgment Part of the job is to warn the people in your community. Thank you. Lot pulls back inside and then the door shuts. That's verse 10. There's the passage of a short time. Lot goes out to his sons and he's like, this city's going to be destroyed. And they're like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? We're going golfing tomorrow. You know, we got a basketball game. We're, we're going to the movies. Like, I, you're crazy. We're not going anywhere. I have to do all this stuff. And he's like, this city's going to be destroyed. Tomorrow morning, get out. And they're like, you're crazy, Dad. You don't know what you're talking about. And he says, look, these angels came. They're here. The, the men who tried to grab me and pull me into pieces, he struck them all. they struck them all blind. And they're like, we don't care what you say. We're not leaving. And so Lot had to take his two daughters and his wife and get out of that city. And then you had destruction. The Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, and that was it. Okay, so is there an end? Notice how in this story also the close of probation, okay, the close of probation is not the raining of fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. The closing of probation is that moment when the angels pull Lot back inside the house and the door shuts. That's when it's over. And they're just dead men walking at this point in time. This is the reality of the situation. And then it says, remember Lot's wife. Who said that? Luke 17, 32. Who do you think said, remember Lot's wife? Okay, that's Jesus who said that. So Jesus is telling you, remember Lot's wife. When Jesus says remember something, is that important? Yes. Okay? He says remember the Sabbath day, right? Yes. So the only commandment that he says that, that starts with the word remember, the whole world is forgetting. They're saying you should forget that commandment. Jesus says remember Lot's wife. Why is he saying remember Lot's wife? Okay, what cost Lot's wife her life? Okay, she loved the city. She loved her stuff. And did you know the spirit of prophecy says that Lot was culpable in the death of his wife? Because Lot delayed. And he was like, I don't want to leave this city. I don't, I don't want to make a separation. That, you know, we put all of our time and all of our money. We've got our whole life in this one spot. And he's like, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. And he's dithering and he's dithering and he's dithering. And because he was a ditherer, his wife died. So husbands, be certain. Be certain. Be steadfast. Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you start to dither, if you're going to say, oh, well, I can't make up my mind, I can't make up my mind, it might cost you your kids or your, or your spouse or your salvation. This is the reality. Remember Lot's wife. It cost him his wife. There she is. In that moment when she looked back, they were told, don't look back. And we are told not to look back either. Amen. 
The Christian religion is a one-directional thing. It's supposed to be a one-directional thing. It is not safe to go the other direction. You know, we all sometimes slide back. We all sometimes fall down because that old world has a hold on us. It kind of pulls us back. And Jesus stands there and he says, get back up, follow me, come with me. You know, the door of mercy is still open. And so, if, you know, don't, I know that this is a serious talk. Don't think to yourself, well, you know, I've fallen down. I, you know, I'm going to be a pillar of salt. Jesus says to you right now in this moment, get, get, get back up and follow me. Yes, sir. I'm thinking that the Abraham was sitting in his tent and his door, and he had ministry. Yeah. When strangers would come by, he would spread the gospel. Yes, he did. Lot also sat at the gate of the city. Yes. And so it's like God marked Abraham and he marked Lot. Oh, they're, they're doing my work. Yeah, Lot was in a bad place. Yeah. Yeah. We all need to have one of those little witnesses. Any, whatever we can do. Amen. Yeah, you have a witness. Thank you for saying that. You have a witness. Lot had a witness. He was in that city, and, and uh, Hebrews, was it Hebrews 11 says that he vexed his righteous soul? Is that Hebrews, or is that another verse? Anyways, Lot suffered because of where he was, but he was a minister. He was the only minister that some people ever heard. And you are... You, as you sit here tonight, I'm telling you right now, friends, your circle of influence, we think to ourselves, you know, you know so-and-so is never going to listen to me. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I do. You know, it doesn't matter if I give them this. It doesn't matter if I pray for them. It matters. For some of these people that you are the only point of contact they are ever going to have. Story number three, the harlot Rahab. Okay, I... Uh, I don't know how long I've been going for here, but um, a couple more, okay? The story number three, the harlot Rahab. Rahab, you know the story, okay? Again, you see the same elements or very similar elements in the story. You have investigation. Where is the investigation? This is the, the children of Israel have crossed, or, uh, sorry, pardon me, are about to cross the River Jordan. They come there with their armies, 40 years in the wilderness. They are about to cross the river. They are about to enter the promised land and make war on the people on the other side. And Joshua sends two spies into Jericho to spy out the place. What are they doing? They're investigating. Okay, so you have an investigative judgment. You have an, invest, an element of investigation. Same thing. They run into Rahab. They minister to Rahab. She hides them underneath the roof with the flax that's, that's drying. And they tell her, and she tells them. She says to them, I know that God has given you this city. I know that your, your people are going to destroy this city. I know it. And she says, when you come into this city, guard me, please. And they tell her, hang a scarlet thread in the window. That scarlet thread represents the blood of Christ. It represents Jesus. It represents the atonement. He bought, he buys Rahab and everybody in her house. And they tell her, if you are on the inside of that house, you're, you're going to be fine. Your whole family, right? You have a closed door. Again, in this story, Rahab's door is the door of probation. If you are on the inside of that door, you are safe. If you are on the outside of that door, you are destroyed. Where are we tonight? Where are you tonight? Look at your heart. Look at where you are spending your time. Jesus loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He bought you back. Where are you tonight? Are you on the inside or are you on the outside? You got a foot in both camps. Are you going back and forth in between the two places? You ever play mu musical chairs? I always hated that game. You know, musical, ga musical chairs is this game where you run around the chairs and when the music stops, you all have to find a chair and they keep taking chairs away. And when the music sh stops, you're looking for a chair. In this situation, when the music stops, it's too late. You're either in your chair or you're not. And if you're not, story number four, the cities of refuge. So is the close of probation a real thing? 
okay? The investigative judgment is a real thing. The day of atonement is a real thing, right? The antitypical investigation that is going on right now, the cities of refuge. This is so interesting, this story, or this, uh, this whole thing. <clears throat> Someone accused of a crime could flee to the city of refuge. What crime are they committed, are they accused of? Murder. They're accused of murder. What kind of murder? Accidental. Accidental murder. They're accused of accidental murder. If you were accused of intentional murder, they'd just execute you. But if you were accused of accidental murder, if something happens where like you're, you're, you're hitting a tree and the axe head comes off and kills your buddy behind you and he dies and then his relatives, they come after you, you know, I mean, there's some pretty rough people out in the hills around here. You know, if Jimmy Joel or Billy Bob gets offed, you know, they show up at your house, they want to shoot you. What are you going to do? You got to flee to the city of refuge. These cities are set up. The elders investigate and adjudicate the offense of murder, accidental murder. There's the text. So until the elders finish the work of investigation, as long as you are inside the city, you're safe. Okay? So you got this in your mind's eye. Okay? It wasn't your intention to kill somebody, but somebody dies as a consequence of something you did. Okay, this is the elements of the story, okay? We'll, bu we'll build on this. Let's pull on the thread a little bit in a moment here. So somebody dies as a result of something you do, and you flee. You run to the city of refuge. And you go to the elders and you say, I'm accused of murder. It was accidental. I never intended for that man to die, or that woman to die. I never intended for that man to die. And they say, come into the city. We're going to investigate. Okay, so you have an investigation. Then you have a separation because you have an accused person on the inside of the city and they can't be touched. On the outside of the city, you have all the people who want to shoot that person. Bring him out. No, he's safe as long as he goes out. Now, you can leave. If you go out, you want to go to you know, Disneyland or something like that, you figure you'll sneak over there. You put a disguise on. You put your like, fake nose on and you're you know, your little eyebrows, and you like, you're like, I'm going to Disneyland today, okay? And they catch you outside the city, they shoot you, and there's no consequences for them, okay? The only place that you are safe in the story is in the city of refuge. Do you see it? Okay? City of refuge. Then you have the closed door, right? The city gates are shut. You can't, these guys can't come in. You have to stay inside the city until the death of the high priest. Until the end of the ministry of the high priest, you have to stay in the city of refuge. That is where there is safety. Do you hear me? Okay, do you hear the story? Okay. When Adam and Eve sinned, was it their intention that the Lord of glory would die? But he did, didn't he? And there is a city of refuge that is set up for us. And the only place that is safe is the city of refuge. If you leave the city of refuge, if you have a foot in both camps, you're not safe. Inside the city of refuge, you're safe. You get to go home at the conclusion of the ministration of the high priest when his ministry ends. All right, do you see, do you see the story here? Who is the high priest ministering for us? Jesus. There is a city of refuge for us that we can go and run and hide. We stay in the city until his work is finished. Then it's safe. But if you step outside of that door, you are taking your life in your hands. This world has all sorts of alluring temptations. The Bible says, he that is unjust, this moment comes where the pronouncement is, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. 
He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. This is the close of probation. No changing teams, right? Right now the door is open. You want to become. You want to come inside. Jesus is saying, "Come inside. Escape the destruction that is coming. Don't wait for your mother or your father or your sister or your brother. Do not wait. It is not safe." Our probation could close tomorrow. It could close tonight. We're going, to finish, we're going to finish the talk with these quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Is that, do you see transgression everywhere? Everybody is, has this, and they're looking at this all the time. You, you have friends in school, and what are they watching? They're on TikTok, they're learning to cast magic spells, they're watching pornography, they're on websites that they shouldn't be on, they're watching stuff they shouldn't be on, they're constantly on this, right? Or they're constantly in cyberspace, they're constantly online. And meanwhile, the, the, the dripping of the sand is disappearing, okay? There is going to be an end. There is going to be an end. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. The world changed very rapidly. You guys remember lockdowns, right? We haven't forgotten lockdowns. Was that fun? Who would have predicted that all of a sudden in March we're going to have lockdowns. Then we're going to have all sorts of restrictions. You can't do this unless you have this thing on your face. You can't breathe properly, but they're like, put it on. You got to get it, then you got to get this thing. Okay, otherwise you can't go here, you can't go there unless you have this thing. Okay. And it just came on very sudden, and it was global. Right? Was it global? Okay. The same thing is going to happen again. We're living in this calm before the storm. It's going to come back. We're going to talk about that extensively on Sabbath afternoon. Okay? It's going to come back. And it's going to break on this world as an overwhelming surprise. In the last scenes of this earth's history, war will rage. I read this week that North Korea is preparing for war. France is preparing for war. Russia and Ukraine are at war. Iran is preparing for war. Israel is at war. NATO is at war. China is preparing for war. Venezuela is preparing for war. The world is preparing for war. This is the most volatile uh, time to live, in, certainly in my life. <clears throat> there is a, a, a general, American general, he says that this is the most volatile time in the Middle East since 1973. And he hasn't seen anything yet. Because the escalation is continuing to just go up and up and up. We're going to talk about all of the signs of the times, but this is what we are told. There will be pestilence. Do we have pestilence for four years? Plague, famine, the waters of the deep will overthrow, overflow their boundaries. What does that mean? It means the ocean doesn't stay in the ocean anymore. All of a sudden, the ocean's in your backyard. You know, Have we seen that happening? Property and life will be destroyed by fire and flood. We should be preparing for the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for them that love him. Listen to the sound of my, of my voice. Do not mess around with this. We are living at the end of times. I am not doing my job. God will hold me accountable if I stand up here and I don't tell you that we are living in the end of times. He will hold me accountable for not telling you that we are living at the end of times. It is my job to tell you. A couple more. The days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us the warning is given. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surefitting and drunkenness, cares of this life, so that the day come upon you unawares. Satan is playing the game for your soul. Okay? It's okay to have a job. It's okay to be at work. It's okay to have a vocation but it's not okay to be frittering away the time of probation with stuff that doesn't matter and ignoring the responsibilities that we have as a Christian.
Beware lest, you, lest it find you unready. Take heed lest you be found at the king's feast without a wedding garment. And then there's this terrifying, you know, this verse here. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Now that's not terrifying if you're ready. If you are living in a state of readiness and you are ready for Jesus to come back and you are sharing the message and you are living, you are walking with him and you are not outside that door, that is not a scary verse. But if you are outside of the door in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Blessed is he that watches and keep his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Did you know that the Bible says, or the, sorry, that the spirit of prophecy says that this, this text in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes, refers to the close of probation. It refers to the close of probation. The door is shut, right? And then a little bit of time elapses and then he comes. But by the time he comes, there's no changing sides, right? It's either you're in or you're out. I mean, we live in surreal times and we're going we're gonna to talk about the times that we live in. One more, one or two more. It is those who do not love the Savior that desire him to remain away and such eagerly receive the testimony borne by unfaithful servants. My Lord delays his coming. So they're happy. Jesus is not coming back for another 500 years. Good. We can go do whatever it is that we want to do. While they refuse to search the scriptures to learn if things, these things are so, they grasp every fable which will put off the coming of Christ into the distant future or make it spiritual, fulfilled at the destruction of Jerusalem or taking place at death. These are the theories that are in Christianity these days. All the prophecies, they were fulfilled in the past. All the prophecies are fulfilled in the future sometime. We don't got to worry about that. And they ignore the present. All right. I'm just going to read this bottom part here. We are now living in the great day of atonement in the typical service while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel. All were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. So what does this mean? It means that there is the responsibility. The high priest is the day of atonement. He's inside. You can't see him. Notice that you can't see the high priest. The high priest is in the sanctuary. This is talking about the Levitical priesthood and the, and the typological service in ancient Israel. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just come and see me afterwards. I'll explain that to you. Okay, but they had this service. Once a year, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. You couldn't see the high priest. He's inside. You're outside, and your job is to look at your life and say, Am I right with God? Am I living in open rebellion against God? Are there things that I need to get rid of in my life? You know, when I became a Christian, you know, I didn't know. There was all these things in my life I didn't even know. The Lord doesn't hit you with all of them all at the same time sometimes. You know, and I'm, I'm walking with the Lord, and he says, I want you to throw those books away. Which, the, these books over here, I'm not even reading them. Yeah, but you have them in the house. They're going to be a temptation for you. You should throw them away. You know, these are all books about, like, uh, you know, fiction and novels and all sorts of things and, you know, magic and sorcery and, and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, I'd rather walk with Jesus than have this book. And I ripped them up and I threw them out. You know, and I've never missed them. I don't miss them. Get rid of them. You got trash in your house? Get rid of it. Seriously, get, yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, look, I mean, we could talk, I'll, I'll, I'll put something in there, I'll put something in there tomorrow about, about on that subject. But, you know, suffice to say, people are wrapped up in all sorts of occult stuff. It's very commonplace in our society. I know a kid who was at Academy, he was heavily involved in the occult at one of our academies. Him and his buddy were doing all sorts of occult stuff. You know, the school doesn't even know. Parents don't even know. You know, this is what's on this thing. You know, spell casting, you know, talking to demons, having manifestations, you know. It's like commonplace now, okay? Get rid of it. Don't, don't hold on to it. I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be sad that you got rid of it. You know, the devil tells you, well, you're not going to be happy if you get rid of this thing. No, you're going to be happy if you get rid of it because you're going to have Jesus, you know. I used to have a bunch of comics. I had traded some toys for comics. 
I hid them from my mother because she didn't uh, want me to have comics. But she found them, <laughs> you know. But that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing, you know. You got to get rid of it for yourself. You, get, you got to get rid of it for yourself. Jesus bought you and he loves you. Let me tell you something. I, I don't want to be long-winded. I'm already over, I'm, I've maybe overstayed my welcome, but... You know, I traveled overseas to, to, to Asia, you know, and, and, you know, you're traveling around, you, like, get to hold the cobras, and you, like, get to wash the elephants, and, you know, you get to feed the giraffes and stuff like this. You go to these places. We live in one of the most over-regulated societies in the world. There's barbed wire everywhere, okay? Heaven is not going to be like that. You can't even envision how cool heaven is going to be. Don't miss heaven because you want to read such and such or watch such and such. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's the devil trying to steal your salvation. And he knows that you are going to go to heaven, which is the place that he wants to go. He wants to go back to heaven because it's lousy down here. And he's like, I hate it down here. And he hates the fact that you will get to go to heaven. And so he says, here's Netflix. Just watch this for about 16 hours a day. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Yeah, you, you know, come on now. You know, this is what he's doing. And the, and the sand runs out. Okay, don't let anybody steal your crown. Run the race. You have an immortal prize waiting for you. Okay, going back here. All were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. So you've got all these people, the high priest is in the sanctuary, and they're looking at their lives, and they're saying, is there anything that I have not confessed? You know, and I just want to say something about hospitality here. You know, it's not just about don't do this and don't do that. There are positive obligations we have as Christians. People, people need to hear the message that we have. There are people who need, you know, they're hungry, not just for the spiritual food, but for, for the temporal food. You know, there are people who need things. You know, are we fulfilling their needs? Are we helping them? You know, being the hands of Jesus. Read Isaiah 58 when you go home tonight and look at what, what uh, the deliverance that is for these people through you is like. <clears throat> um, in like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life should now in the few remaining days of their probation afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of heart. The light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. There is earnest warfare before all who would subdue the evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. You know, some people don't like to read stuff like this because it's so straight and direct. It's so straight and they're like, oh man, I, I can't stand reading this. But the reason it's so straight is because Jesus is coming back. We are living in the last days of this earth's history. And he wants us to be ready. Don't have a foot in either camp. You know, Jesus left the throne of glory for you. You know, and this place is lousy. I got to tell you, I mean, it's dark and it's lousy. You know, and he was persecuted, and he was scorned, and he was hated, and he was mocked, and he was spit on for you and for me. You know, and it's heartbreaking. Let it break your heart. Let it break your heart and pull the things out of your hands that you do not need, that are, being, that are tailor-made to keep you from salvation, to steal your salvation. Last story, and then we'll conclude with prayer. When I was a little kid, this story always stuck with me. I must have made it, maybe it was in the bedtime stories or something like that. I don't remember. Probably. I remember this story about this kid who went to a museum. And they went to some priceless vase and they got the vase stuck on their hand. Have you guys heard this story? They get the vase stuck on their hand. And this vase is like worth a million dollars. Okay? And they try butter, and they try olive oil, and they try everything. And this kid is like got his, his hand in the vase, okay? A million dollar vase. And the mother is like, what are, what are you doing? Pull your hand out. She was so upset and embarrassed. 
you know, pull your hand out. No, 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 nothing worked. Finally, the museum is closing, and the proprietor of the museum says, I, it's going to kill me to do this. It's going to kill me to do this. But we have to break it. And she's like, no, no, let's try olive oil one more time. They put the olive oil on the wrist, and they get the wrist all up, and they're pulling. Pull, Johnny, pull. No. So they take a hammer, and they break the vase. And what do you think they found? He had his fist like this, and he had a penny in his hand. Okay? Don't lose salvation for some piece of trash on this earth. Okay? Open your hand and let it go and be free. You're not going to be sorry. You're not going to be sorry. Let it go. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, every head is bowed. Lord, these are the people that you bought, bought with a price. Lord, we don't want to lose salvation for a penny. Lord, help us to make a commitment to you. We can't even give you our hearts, but what we can say to you tonight is, please, take our hearts. We can't even give them. We don't even trust ourselves to give them, but you can take them and we give you permission to take them and to be Lord of our lives. If that is your desire, please raise your hand while every head is bowed. Lord, you see your children here tonight. You see your children and how precious they are, not willing that anyone should perish. And the door is open for them to have an eternity, an eternity with Jesus and the infinite freedom and liberty and adventure and study and just all of the incredible things that your salvation has bought, that is our inheritance. Lord Jesus, please take our hearts tonight. As you see, each hand has been raised. In your name, amen.